Hey, Emily. Hey, Stephanie. You uh, want to do a podcast? Absolutely. Welcome to Cycle Chats, a podcast to destigmatize what it means to be a woman. This is episode 36, PMS versus PMDD, where we talk to a woman here to take PMDD sufferers from stuck and sick to empowered and thriving through education. Here she is herself, Jess. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for being here. Also, your headphones are awesome. They're super retro and I love them. Oh my goodness. My husband is an audio engineer, so I have to have all the things. Understood. My husband is our tech guy behind the scenes. So if anything goes wrong, my husband Miguel is there to fix the problem because I just press a lot of buttons and usually those buttons start deleting things and it just goes a it's little like Miguel. crazy. Yeah. Miguel, are you home? <laughs> Hello. Yeah. It's okay. handy to have them around, isn't it? Yes, it is. I don't know what I would do without him. Literally. I, I don't know. So thank you again for being here. And my first question always is what made you get into this field? Mm, That's such a good question. And I also love how you ask what made you because in my story, it was kind of a forced happenstance more than a chosen path, I guess you could say, which doesn't matter either way. I'm happy to be here, but it kind of all started when I got my period. It was pretty traumatic as far as moods go, just straight from the start. I started my period when I was 12 and pretty much every subsequent cycle after that first period of menarche was increasingly difficult to manage my psychological symptoms. And so eventually my mother started taking me to physicians and gynecologists, kind of like, you know, this is not normal. I never experienced this. And I was told it's normal. It will take time for your cycle to regulate, which is true, but the severity of the symptoms I was experiencing wasn't normal. And unfortunately they never regulated. (laughs) So for 17 years, I dealt with debilitating cycles and I was misdiagnosed as bipolar. I was put on antipsychotics when I was 17. I had already been on multiple birth controls at that time. I was misdiagnosed with major depression. I was put on antidepressants when I was very young before I was 20 as well. And then at a point, neither of, or any of those medications worked, the hormonal contraceptives. Sometimes they helped, but also sometimes they exacerbated my symptoms. And at this time I was so young and and PMDD wasn't even added to the DSM yet. So I wasn't self-aware as far as what was going on. Even certain times I couldn't link that my psychological symptoms were related to my period and my mother would have to remind me and remind me, this is because of your cycle, you're gonna bleed, it's gonna get better. After I was on those medications for a while, my whole life just went downhill. I developed disordered eating habits, I quit dancing, I was a dancer all my life, I lost a bunch of friends. I mean, I don't know if that was an exact correlation to the medication, but it was at the same time. And so I got off the medication eventually, and I kind of gave up seeking out support for this issue because for years I kept seeking out support and getting nowhere and nothing was helping. So many more years went by and eventually I determined that what I had was PMDD. I was put back on a hormonal contraceptive. That time I was more aware of what was going on and it massively exacerbated my symptoms, but I was told just stay on the medication. I was increasingly suicidal. And at that point I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. Like I'm not staying on this medication. I will not survive. So I hit a pretty hardcore rock bottom at that point. I lost my relationship that I got on the contraceptive partially for as well as the symptoms. I lost my job. I couldn't get out of bed. I went from being in bed from two weeks out of the month to the entire month. And at that point I was just kind of like, okay, something's got to give. like, there's nothing about this that's normal. And I have to figure out a way to move forward because I cannot live my life like this. And so that's when I started experimenting with integrative protocols. And I started just learning cycle awareness and body literacy around reproductive health. And within three months on that journey, I had a symptom-free period for the first time in my entire life. I was just like, whoa, if this is possible, can I have a successful relationship? Can I have a career? Can I 
work enough to save money to buy a home, which was a big goal of mine. I mean, none of that was, I didn't think I was going to live until I was <laughs> into my thirties at that point. So once I had that symptom free period, I just kind of started reevaluating everything and just continued on that journey and decided I needed to share this information with other menstruating people and women because so many people are suffering with this and they don't even know what it is. And there are ways to reduce and coping skills to massively improve your quality of life with PMDD. So now that's what I do. <laughs> kind of a long story, but. No, thank you so much for sharing that because it's it hits close to home. And I say this because eight or nine months ago, I kind of came to this light bulb moment. I was like, every time I get my period, something shifts completely in me and I don't know what it is. And I had found on the internet PMDD. And I'm not saying that's what I have, but it was the first time I found something that I went, oh, this this is actually like a real thing. And I had gone to the gynecologist. They put me on an antidepressant. That sent me into full-blown panic disorder, ended up in the hospital twice. I'm on antidepressants now. I'm working through anxiety recovery, but I do notice that around my period, and this has just always been a thing, that my mood shifts completely. And it's the most bizarre like feeling because I'm like, what is going on? But through finally noticing that, I'm starting to be able to regulate it because I'm aware of it. It's such an unknown thing. And it's so sad because I feel like there's a lot of people that probably think that they're absolutely losing it when this is something that absolutely can be worked on with or without antidepressants, with or without, you know, birth control. Emily and I both talk about our experience with birth control. I got depressed towards the end of it. I was just sad all the time. And I was like, well, this sucks. So I got off of it. And, you know, within the month I was like, ta-da. So for those who don't know what PMDD is, what is it? Yeah. So PMDD is premenstrual dysphoric disorder is the full name and it is a cyclical reproductive mood disorder. So it's related to hormones, but it's not necessarily a hormone imbalance. Although many people who do experience PMDD also have a hormonal imbalance just because that's super prevalent in our modern world, but it's not inherently a hormone imbalance. It's more of a sensitivity within the brain to the fluctuating chemicals and the fluctuating hormones that happen throughout the month. And those fluctuations are normal, but people that are experiencing PMDD are highly sensitive to those shifts. So generally the kind of way you determine if it's PMDD or not is the symptoms present during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. So as you both know, there are four phases of the menstrual cycle. Now, yeah. Now we do because of our podcast. We didn't know before the podcast. Right? Someone was yeah. like, yeah, there's four phases. We're like, what did you just say? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? A little bit. 30. And I didn't know that. Oh no. Yeah. So this is, this is a, a major starting point when we work towards healing and management, but yeah, there are four phases. Most of us don't know that until we're in our thirties or late twenties. And it's during the luteal phase that PMDD presents, which is after ovulation and before menstruation. And the luteal phase can last around nine to 18 days. So that's when symptoms are presenting and it's the premenstrual period. So a lot of times in society, for some reason, there's this myth that it's the period that's so bad. And for some people it is, you know, if you're dealing with endometriosis or adenomyosis, you're cramping and your period can be very painful. But as far as premenstrual symptoms go, those are generally occurring before you bleed. And that's the case with PMDD. It's kind of like a light switch moment where as soon as you ovulate, estrogen begins to drop and progesterone rises and you're very sensitive to that shift. So that's when symptoms start and symptoms are psychological as well as physical, but it is a mood disorder. So the psychological symptoms are generally more prevalent and more difficult for people to deal with. And if you're experiencing really severe physical symptoms, that's kind of pointing to dysregulated body systems and maybe an underlying condition. Yeah, but it's in those kind of nine to 18 days before you have your period. And then once you bleed, your hormones drop to the lowest level that they are in the entire cycle. And that's just such a relieving moment. So having that kind of Jekyll and Hyde switch back and forth from feeling like yourself to feeling like a completely different person and being unable to cope, that's another difference between PMDD that helps identify it is the severity of the symptoms. 
So where PMS is difficult and annoying and you know painful sometimes it doesn't get in the way of you living your life whereas pmdd is very debilitating it's crazy every time we like are educated on something that's like happening in our bodies i i just get kind of like angry i find myself because i'm i just am kind of baffled that we are in a society where we're not being educated about what's going on, but geometry is very important. But Steph and I just had this conversation the other day. We were like, why isn't there not like a life 101 class somewhere where they teach you how to do your taxes and like what a mortgage is, all of these things that you actually need to know. And I'm sorry for all the mathematicians out there. Yes, geometry is important, but not in my life personally. I'd much more prefer to learn about what's actually going on in my body, right? like the things that I need to know to make myself and my life better since we only have one life to live. Yeah, especially when it's something that you're dealing with every month and it's directly connected to your health. In 2015, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Academy of Pediatrics named the menstrual cycle the fifth vital sign. So that means it's right there next to your temperature, your heart rate. I mean, all of the other things that we're using to measure how healthy you are. And if you went into the hospital with 104 degree fever, you would get immediate attention and people would be, you know, teaching you and helping you manage that symptom. But when we're dealing with the same level of severity with menstrual symptoms, it's just like, "Mm, take some birth control or it's normal. And there's nothing normal about suffering through a monthly biological process, which has perpetuated our species for (laughs) the entire history of humans. Like it's just no full stop. So how do you advocate for yourself in a healthy way and not just take what your doctor's saying at face value? So there are a few things I, I want to say about your experience, but First of all, how you would advocate for yourself, there are many ways you can do this, and I teach a lot about this with my students and clients, but one of the first things is to, it sounds like you're already doing this, but really detail, get really detailed with your cycle tracking. And so a lot of people do cycle tracking, pretty much everyone, where they they notate, okay, my period started on this day and it ended on this day. Generally, that's as specific as people get, but you can use your body literacy education and you can gain more body literacy education to be tracking specific biomarkers, which indicate hormone levels. So that could help tell you if you're dealing with a estrogen dominance situation or a progesterone deficiency situation, which if you're dealing with one, you're dealing with the other most likely. But doing symptom mapping as well is really helpful because if you go in with really detailed information, your physician can't argue with your data, especially if you're tracking over the course of a few months. And that's also what helps you get a formal diagnosis. But with symptom mapping, what I'm talking about is you're writing the most prevalent reoccurring symptoms that you get premenstrually or throughout your cycle. You can do this even if you're not experiencing PMDD. And you would write those down. And what you're going to do is you're going to record whether or not those symptoms are mild, moderate, severe, or non-existent. And you'll start to see that pattern over the course of your cycle. Okay, my symptoms are ticking up on this day, and this is how severe they are. And when you start to record that and you go in and you say, I'm having suicidal ideation that's severe for seven days of the month, or I'm having breast tenderness, or I'm having depression or anxiety, you know, your physician can't argue with that. Something else that's really important is to bring someone with you like your mother, because what happens, especially with people who are experiencing PMDD, is it is so all consuming that the individual can't even really put together, like you're saying, what's going on in the moment and what's happening. Whereas if you bring someone with you, they're going to be able to kind of, which it shouldn't be this way, but back you up and say, I see this happening. It's severe. It's noticeable. It's impacting her life. And when you're in with a physician, they have so little time with you. You're in fight or flight, especially if you're getting a physical exam. So it's helpful to just have someone there with you who can kind of keep you on track and also just remember the conversation. Because when you are, when your central nervous system is dysregulated like that, you can't remember, you can't remember your questions. So it's also important to come in with all of your questions written down. So you don't have to worry about what were, what was I going to ask anyways? so often we get like that and we only have 10 minutes 
15 minutes with the provider max. And so you really have to go in locked and loaded. So those are a few tips, but just wanted to tie in with that, your experience of not being able to notice what was happening. That's completely normal. And a lot of times that's where the self-awareness starts coming in because people are saying, you know, I don't want to be in a relationship with you because you lose it and it's hard to be around. You can use that symptom mapping to determine whether or not you're experiencing something called premenstrual exacerbation, which is very common versus PMDD. And that, you know, all the information that we can get in all your data is helpful. So if you're noticing, I experience anxiety on my symptom mapper every day of the month, but in the post ovulatory phase and that luteal phase section of the menstrual cycle, my anxiety is severe. That's letting us know, okay, well, you're dealing with anxiety and it's not just PMDD. Okay. And that can happen with ADHD. That can happen with depression. That can happen with any condition. And premenstrual exacerbation is a core premenstrual disorder, but there's less data. It's not technically added as a diagnosis, but it's really helpful when you're working towards treating and managing those symptoms, how you're going to approach it. It's so interesting you're saying all of this because I remember it's like now making me remember when I stumbled across it for the first time. And I was like, ah, and it just gave me hope that whatever I was dealing with was somehow linked to my period. And so we talked a little bit about how it affects the mind, but how does PMDD affect your body? So people experience different symptoms, but some of the main symptoms that are physical would be bloating, cramping, headaches, joint swelling, and just discomfort, breast swelling, and fibrocystic breast tissue, so breast pain, breast swelling. It's hard because some of the symptoms kind of cross the barrier. Brain fog, lack of coordination, uh, those play a little bit more into physical symptoms, but also mental symptoms. Yeah, I think those are kind of some of the main, main ones that people with PMDD experience on the physical side of the spectrum. It's more exaggerated than someone who's experiencing a normal period. Yeah, that that same severity approach still applies, but because PMDD is a mood disorder, you could have bloating, cramping, constipation, nausea, vomiting, a lot of those PMS symptoms, and it wouldn't be PMDD. It's not, it's not PMDD until it's it's paired with the psychological symptoms. And that's, that's generally the, the hardest for people to deal with. People seem more capable of dealing with the physical symptoms. Now, if you're, if you have severe cramping and it's an underlying condition like endometriosis, no, that's very serious pain, but generally with PMDD, it's the physical symptoms or it's the psychological symptoms. And something else to note is that physical symptoms, especially if there's no saliva, blood, urine, in genetic test to prove that you have PMDD, that you have a persistent neurological case of PMDD, and it's absolutely a neurological pathway that's causing it. So a lot of these symptoms overlap hormone imbalance symptoms. So things, a lot of these physical symptoms can easily be addressed or reduced with integrative protocols, whereas it does help with integrative protocols for sure and the psychological symptoms, but it's more challenging to address those symptoms because it's it's not always as simple as, oh, a nutrient deficiency is leading to cramping or, you know, gut dysbiosis is leading to constipation. So in the work that I do, I'm always helping people link symptoms to body systems because then we can directly start to understand maybe where the dysfunction is and take targeted action towards that. And I always like to talk about symptoms as being the language that your body uses to communicate to you that something's wrong because your, your body can't send you a DM like, Hey, things are not going well in here. It's going to make you physically uncomfortable increasingly until you listen. Right? So I like to kind of use that new language of symptom empowerment to shift the often victimization people get into, whether it be physical or psychological symptoms, like, hey, your body is talking to you. So let's listen to what those symptoms are and let's connect those to these body systems so that we can start taking targeted action instead of just being like, ah, I 
everything's terrible. There's no direction from here and I can only take an SSRI or a hormonal contraceptive, which alters my physiology and doesn't treat a root cause of any of this. And also the birth control thing, side note, when you were talking about how you took it because of this, is how I interpreted it. So correct me if I'm wrong, that you took it partly because of a partner. I've done it. And it's just, ladies, don't do it. They're not worth it. They're just not they can put on a condom. They're not too big. It fits. <laughs> and they're definitely not allergic. There's options. So like this BS that gets thrown around and I've heard it before. I'm like, uh, uh, uh. You've been told That's it not- before. I've been told it. Yeah. Heard it, told it. I mean, it's gross. So that's just a side note. It's like we have a friend who takes it and it helps her regulate her period. Hormonal and it's birth great. control. Yeah. Hormonal. And she loves it. She it, She's never had an issue with it. But I would say for the majority, I've, I've heard people be like, yeah, major depression, got off of it, was totally fine. So it's, it's, I think it's important to research. Don't believe everything you read because, you know, there's a lot of false information out there, which is why I always encourage people to, when they're doing their research, find individual individuals like you who have actually had the experience, you've had the this, the clinical part of it, you understand it in a way that, you know, Reddit can't really <laughs> go on and tell you what it is. So we talked about what it is, some of the psychological parts of it, but we're big on call to action. So how can we manage, how can someone manage their symptoms if they suspect they have PMDD? How can they manage it? Well, there are many approaches. I have a specific protocol that I use for myself that I live by and that I teach and work with my clients on that I think is kind of streamlined. You know, I worked on this for four years, kind of just on my own trailblazing. How do I deal with this issue with a lack of education? And I've kind of distilled that into this protocol, which it doesn't matter if I'm doing coaching or if I'm doing education, it's all, it's all related to this protocol and this system. And so it starts out with body literacy. I mean, if you don't know how your body works, how are you going to do anything about it? I mean, it's just basic first principles. Like let's start at A, if you want to get to C, what even is going on here? What are the organs that make up your reproductive system? What is the cycle? How many phases are there? What's normal? What's not normal? And once you start knowing what's normal and you start tracking, so there's two parts to body literacy. First, it's understanding what the body systems are, how the body functions, optimally what's required to support those body systems. Then you have to look at, okay, well, now that I have that information, what's happening in my own body? I first suggest people do that with cycle awareness. Okay, what's my pattern here with these symptoms? What's going on? Do I fit within the healthy range of what a normal cycle is, but then you're going to take that into all of these other body systems that play into your reproductive health. And so I break that down into the seven core areas of hormone health to help people kind of have a step-by-step approach. And so I can talk a little bit about what those core areas are if you guys are interested, Um, but body literacy is always a component. But I just like to start with cycle awareness because we don't know what's going on in your cycle. We can't really keep moving through the other systems that are connected to your reproductive health. What would be one of the seven systems that are the most important? Like they're all important, but aside from body awareness, literacy, understanding what's happening, which one, let me ask 16 questions in one. One. What are they? And then which one would you pick as the second most important? Okay. What are the core areas of hormone health? Is that the question? Yeah. You can just kind of list them off. You don't have to get super detailed with it because we want people to head over to your website and like really get to know you and all that. But just so we kind of get an outline of what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So the seven areas are nutrition, movement, environment, and that includes your physical environment, but a really important facet of of the environment core area is exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals, which we have very little knowledge on and is a huge impactor in your period symptoms. Relationships, spirituality, and by spirituality, I mean your values and beliefs about yourself and how you fit into the world. Sleep and resiliency. But from a physiological standpoint, it doesn't matter how great you're doing in the spirituality core area or how great your relationships are if you're not sleeping, if you're not working on stress management, if you don't move your body, and if you're not very conscious about your nutrition, you're going to have hormone dysregulation. It's just a given. I'm so glad 
you said that. That's, it's so important. I think we talk about toxic positivity a lot and it's something that I just don't drive with. You can't force this like, well, just smile, just be happy, drink a glass of water. It's it's more than that. And I think also too, I had kind of an aha moment with myself. I was working out today and I was like, God, I am just exhausted. Like trying to get to the third set was a nightmare, but I'm like, I'm going to push myself. Then finally I realized towards the end of it, I went, I'm still in my period. My body doesn't want to be working out like this. My hormones aren't there enough and I feel weak. And so once I like locked into that, I just, I slowed down. I did the movement slow. I cut it in half. I was like, I'm not going to like try to power through this because of whatever fitness person was telling me to like keep going queen. I'm like, no, I'm dying. So as women, I wish we had more knowledge of that. Even that, right? You're on your period. You think, oh, just tough through it. We're always told to just tough through all of these things. But the truth is, if you are in tune with your body, it's telling you what it needs. And if you're pushing too hard, I think that's where, for me at least, that's where the mental state comes in is if I'm doing too much and I'm pushing too hard, it's like a love note I've heard from your mind and your body, anxiety, sadness, all of that. It's a love note to say, hey, we got to slow down a little bit because we're getting we're getting overheated here and we don't like it. And so we're trying to tell you to slow down. So it's, I think, being aware of all of that. And so I'm, I'm glad that you brought up about that because I think a lot of times people just think they can meditate and woosah all of their problems away. It's, I don't know, I feel like it's less about trying to feel better all the time, but it's more about making peace with those uncomfortable feelings and learning that you're still safe if they're there, but to manage them so they're not going, you know, like a roller coaster, but it's more just kind of a wee. Like a, I don't know, a kid slide maybe. <laughs> because what I'm, I'm trying to to picture, you know, more that. Yeah, one hundred percent. You really have to pair that self awareness, which again, that's another thing. No one ever teaches you that. I mean, that's you're on your own with that, and so that's something we focus a lot on in my program. But you have to have that self awareness, and when you start to understand those phases of your cycle and what your body needs in each of those phases, you're able to be a lot more gentle with yourself because you know, yeah, in my menstrual phase, if I push through, I'm going to be depleted <laughs> when I move into my follicular phase, and there are other ways to support yourself than just the grind. And that's just a societal norm that's been passed along and just goes along with our society being based on the circadian rhythm versus any consideration of the infradian rhythm, which is what people who menstruate live on as well. We kind of operate on two time clocks. What are those? That's a new, that's a new word for me. I know circadian, but I don't know the other one. Oh, so this is, this is exactly what you're talking about. Your self-awareness around what your body needs and different cycles. So a lot of times people talk about this as far as cycle syncing and how you support each phase. I use phase specific living in my program. That's the language that I use, but ultimately these are chronobiology times that your body systems operate on. We know the circadian rhythm, all of our bodies operate on that, whether you're male or female, but if you're female, your, your body is also operating on what's called the infradian rhythm, which is your menstrual cycle. So it's around 28 days. And that is completely different as far as physiologically what's happening in your body than the infradian rhythm. So we need to account for both. If you really want to optimize your health and well-being as a female, get mm-hmm. ready to hear me say that word all the time. That's it. Wrong. Oh, so much faith you have in me, Emily. (laughs) It sounds like a, like a group of people in a sci-fi book, the Infradia, the strong women who live by the sun and the moon, you know, very witchy vibes. I like it. I'm in, I'm ready. Yeah. And that's where that body literacy comes in too. It's like, whoa, what? I mean, your brain changes 25% throughout the cycle just because of the hormones that are there. So human beings are magnificent, specifically women. I, my sister-in-law just gave birth to the first little baby in the family. I have a little nephew and I'm in love with him, but like the thought of that has always just blown my mind. I'm like, we literally grow a human being inside of us. It's just a tiny human. That's why when people are like, "Eh, being a mom is so easy. I'm like, motherhood is like the hardest job ever. And that nine months is wild. You are essentially like farmers growing their crops, except it's you cultivating, (laughs) harvesting a human (laughs) for the season. So I know it's a little (laughs) Emily's face. She's like, I don't like that. It just, it's really important to understand how much power you have 
as a woman, just naturally, just you being born a woman, congratulations. You've literally hit the jackpot. And I believe that because there are so many beautiful things that we can do. Unfortunately, we are not educated about them. So I think that's where we need a little bit of work, especially in our school systems. I just like that you focus so much on the educational aspect, right? When you were like talking about getting prepared for the doctors and like having your questions listed and also doing your own research and being able to chart and like go in with like actual evidence, I think is so important. Like that's always something that I try and teach my students, right? Is like, do you think you're going to pass the test if you don't study for it? I really like that aspect that you're like, no, go in with your questions, go in with your chart, show them that you've done the research, prove it to them. And then have a conversation. And then it's like, you're almost on the same playing field instead of them talking down to you and kind of telling you what's happening. You get to tell them what's happening and their solution can hopefully help you. But like a big thing that Steph and I always talk about is asking why, right? Like we just don't ask why a lot. Yeah. There's definitely a power dynamic going on when you go in to see a physician and there's mindset work that people can do around that where, you know, you need to, you're paying this individual. This person is getting paid for your services. So you need to approach this like you're hiring someone to work for your help. You have to kind of do some mindset work before you go in having those questions and all those things we talked about, but also being ready to say, what are my other options to evaluate whether or not this individual is educated on, especially PMDD, because a lot of people aren't. And, and unfortunately, the thing that I struggle with most with allopathic physicians is when they don't know something, they can't admit that. And I would so much rather someone admit, I don't really know. These are the things I know that people prescribe for that. I don't really have the education. I'm willing to look into that more, but there's, there's none of that. It's just, here you go, bye. And being able to walk in and say, you know, what are my other options and being prepared to say, this isn't the right physician for me and I have to keep going. I mean, it takes 12 years on average for a person to get a PMT diagnosis and they see over six physicians statistically. And so I wish if I could look back at myself on my journey that I would have had that education of just like, you are the CEO of your health. You decide and you need to decide before you go in what is a possibility for you and what's not. Because especially if you think it's PMDD, I can tell you straight up, your options are going to be hormonal birth control, or an SSRI. Maybe if your physician is educated whatsoever, they will offer you a supplement regimen first, which is amazing. And you should probably stay with that physician, but generally that's not the case. So you need to do a little bit of research on whether or not you think those are an option for you. And physicians don't give you the cons. They give you the pros. Take this. It's going to help with this. Okay. Well, what are the cons? And there are many, and you can't make an informed decision. You can't have informed consent around your healthcare if you aren't educated on the cons. And there are many, many cons, as you both know, on a physiological and mental health level with both of those medications, which is really ironic because it's like, wait a second, you're prescribing this medication, hormonal contraceptive, which repeatedly in study after study has led to people becoming depressed and being highly more likely to be prescribed an SSRI. Okay, well, depression is a main symptom of PMDD. So at least to screen for that as the person gets on medication, because we know that hormonal contraceptives can massively exacerbate PMDD. And that's just something that it seems like they never even consider when they put you on that. And then with SSRIs, it's like they have a black box warning from the FDA because of the crazy amount of suicides and suicide attempts related to SSRIs. Okay, well, people with PMDD are 85% of them experience suicidal ideation. They're 70% more likely to experience suicidal ideation than people who don't experience PMDD and 30% attempt suicide. Now, I want you to keep in mind with those statistics that they're estimating one in 20 women or people who menstruate have PMDD, but 90% of cases are undiagnosed. So let's get real. There are a lot more people experiencing severe psychological symptoms with their period than we know, and they're being misdiagnosed or left undiagnosed. So to then just give these two options without telling them what the major risks are, it's really, really scary. And also I'm not here to shame anyone's decision. I work in integrative medicine, which includes these allopathic 
protocols, but never ever in integrative medicine will a naturopath or functional medicine doctor or integrative physician go first to a medication, a strong psychotropic medication that's going to alter your physiology. What they're going to do first is they're going to look at what is causing this massive sensitivity to these natural fluctuations. Let's talk about the body system. Let's do some testing. Let's work on those similar core areas that I use in my protocol before we go and put you on some of these powerful medications, which can develop dependency and an SSRI. I mean, really, really scary stuff. Those are an option still, but we're not going to go there first. And it just devastates me that that is what women come up against every single day when they do go to an allopathic physician to finally get up the courage to go in there with whether or not they have their support person in their notes or not to just then be only offered those two options. Because what happens is you try those two options and if they don't work for you, the hopelessness is unbelievable. You are living in a black hole of darkness and there is nowhere to go. And that's just not reality. That is not, you do not only have two options. You have so many protocols and modalities for you to try to support your system, to educate yourself, to get coping skills, to develop endless tools in order to manage these symptoms and reduce them. It's just a flat out lie and a disservice to these individuals who are, are suffering. Well said. And also no one is alone. I mean, the more that Steph and I do this now 36 episodes in, and the more we hear from you guys and, and guests, we're all the same. We've all had similar things. Our stories all connect. Women share this same narrative, which is such a beautiful thing, which is why when we do band together, when we do get together, when we stop the competition and start the collaboration, that's when we rise to the top, ladies. It's not bashing the woman at the grocery store. It's empowering her. It's educating her. It's inspiring her because whatever you're feeling, she's most likely feeling. It's just the reality of being a woman. We have so many shared experiences, which just make that so beautiful about connecting with one another because then we get to kind of be like oh I dealt with that and put the puzzle piece together if you are feeling like you don't want to be here please stay we love you you're worth it you are so worth it and it doesn't matter how bad it feels I promise you it gets better it's just a rain cloud it's just a nasty storm you'll get out of it and you are worth it just my little side note because I think kind of all at some level or another been there and it's not fun to be but if you stick around long enough to see that the world is beautiful, there's just so much for it to offer you. Also, there's people like Jess out there and all of our other guests that are literally there to help women. Like that is amazing. That's amazing that there's so many women out there trying to help other women that uh, gives me all the heebie-jeebies and the happiness inside of me. So I am feeling super empowered. So my question is, what does women empowerment mean to you? I'm kind of, I'm a little bit like a broken record here, but I, I feel like empowerment comes from self-efficacy, which is trying something, succeeding, and then having the courage and the wherewithal to try again. But I think it's hard to try things when you have no education. So I always come back to that body literacy component, that cycle awareness component, and knowing that you can take a deliberate action towards improving your health, see it work, and then continue on that trajectory. It always amazes me when people act like it is hard because when you're suffering so badly and you, your symptoms are so severe, it seems a little bit weird to think, well, if I just work on my sleep hygiene, or if I really dive into hormone nutrition, or if I work on reducing my endocrine disrupting chemical exposure, how is any of that singularly going to make an impact? And the reality <laughs> And the analogy I like to use is like, let's just think back to the last time you were real hungover and tell me if your decisions that you made had any impact on those symptoms. And when we're talking about PMDD and we're talking about hormone symptoms, you know, you can't really just isolate one of these core areas. You really have to zoom out and look, oh, there are all of these factors that are playing in. So, you know, I need that education. I need that cycle awareness and that body literacy. And then I need to start taking action in multiple areas, step by step, targeted, 
based on my symptoms. And as soon as you start to see that reduction, you're going to be empowered to continue on that trajectory, just like you're empowered to not get wasted after you were just hung over for, you know, at least some time. It's true. It's a great analogy. <laughs> it's, I've, been, I've been there more times than I to count. That's probably why I drank and then was like, this is terrible. I'm never going to do this again. And then just never did it again. I was like, no, nah, this isn't bad. I don't like this. Which leads me to my last question of what it advice would you give your 15 year old self? This is really good, going to show who, the kind of person that I am. I have some strong libertarian values in, in, in this way where, like I said, you are responsible for your health. Only you are going to be the one that's going to be able to take action and change. You can reach out for support. And I highly advocate that you do that and you build a system of collaborative care so that you're getting help from different angles. But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to figure out your symptoms and your responsibility to do something about it. It doesn't matter how many people you see, you're the one making your decisions in your daily life that's impacting your symptoms. So I think I would tell myself, you need to figure this out way sooner than letting 17 years pass where you want to die every month because of your period. Like you got to do something. And I wish I would have done something sooner, but I didn't know there were other options. I didn't even know what was happening. So I would also say, maybe learn how your body works. Maybe learn what your period is in the first place. So you can just start to figure out what components are making that up so that you can start supporting those components to reduce those symptoms. Yeah. I would tell myself a lot of things. It's important for us to, to talk about it, to bring it to light. And we can all say, you know, what would I I tell my 15 year old self. And I, sometimes when I start to get on the past parade, I ask myself, can I build a time machine? Is that possible right now? A hundred percent of the time it's no. So then I tell myself, okay, well, what can I do moving forward? What lesson have I learned from that? And I do truly believe that the people who have gone through it become the best teachers with the most care, the most compassion because they've, they've done it and they didn't know who to turn to. And we can wish that we had an us when we were younger, but we're the us that we needed. And that's beautiful because, you know, we're going to help some little girl or a little boy, or just, you know, just a kid say, I'm not alone. And then they're going to grow up and they're going to help that person. And then it's a ripple effect. And Emily likes to say this a lot. And I feel like it's a really good analogy is that you can drop a pebble in the pond and you'll see the ripples, but you're not going to see the waves that you make later. That's okay because you know that you made those ripples. The other person can enjoy that wave that's standing far along the coast to be like, wow, that was beautiful. And that's because of you. That's a beautiful analogy. We're really hitting home here. Well, this was a delight. You are very eloquent in how you speak. You are very educated. And I love that you advocate for your body and for the body of other women. So where can people find you? And do you have any fun projects coming up that we should keep our little peepers open for? So I'm most active sharing educational content and information on Instagram at Her Mood Mentor. But I also have a website, www.hermoodmentor.com. And yeah, as far as projects coming up, I'm getting ready to launch my full course called PMDD Rehab, where I step-by-step -step help people walk through this program in order to learn skills and tools to reduce their symptom presentation. It's all specific to PMS and PMDD because that's what I specialize in. Thank you so much for joining us. Per the usual, folks, whoever's listening. If you don't already know, we do have a website called www.cyclechats.com where we have a beautiful community of cycle cats and a blog to let you in a little bit on the personal side of Emily and I. We also have an Instagram and upcoming a YouTube. So stick around for those things. If you can like, comment, subscribe, take 30 seconds out of your day to leave a little review if you learned something interesting. And also a big thanks to you, Jess, and hopefully everyone goes and checks out her website, which I just absolutely gushed over because aesthetic on point, total mood. I love it. And just thank you so much for taking time to speak with us and to kind of open up your brain a little bit and, and educate us and our listeners. And I think we'll all be better for it. And uh, well, we hope you sync up with us next time. <laughs>